Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. The disciples came to Jesus and asked him when these things shall be. He had shown them the temple and said that all the stones of the temple would be pulled asunder, speaking of his coming again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give forth her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things have been fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of the day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as were the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know the flood until it came. It took them away. So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Our final lesson is from the work, the Arcana Celestra, meaning Secrets of Heaven, number 6 and 5. The subject now being treated of is the formation of a new church. Now, this is the story of Noah. And the formation is described by the ark in which all living things of every kind were received. But as, want is, uh, but as is wont to be the case, before that new church could arise, it was necessary that the person of the church should suffer many temptations, which are described by the lifting up of the ark, its fluctuations, its delay upon the waters of the flood, and finally, that Noah and those of the ark spiritually became true spiritual people. They were set free. And therefore is described as secession of the waters and the many things that follow. No one can see this who adheres to the letter of the word only. And in consequence, especially is this the case of all the things being historically connected and presented in the idea of a history of events. But such was the style of the people of that time in the writing, and it was most pleasing to them to present all things wrapped up in representative figures, and that these should be arranged in the form of a kind of history. And the more, more coherent the historical series, the better suited it was to their genius. For in those ancient times, people were not so much inclined to just data and facts as they are at this day, but to profound thoughts of which the offspring is described. In other words, the profound thoughts and how they, the details come. This was the wisdom of the ancients. That the flood and the ark and therefore the things described in connection with them signify regeneration and also the temptations that precede regeneration. Some degree of this is already known by the learned of this day who also compare regeneration and temptations to the waters of a flood. Um, we learn from the teachings of the new church that the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are written in a style that the ancients revered, a style that is similar to the style of mythology and the myths that we have even today come out of this style of writing where individual people and characters and the things that took place with them each represent something that has to do with a spiritual quality. It doesn't mean these sections of the word aren't true. It means that the truth of them doesn't lie in the factual ideas that are being presented. For some people, this is a hard spiritual pill to swallow. 
We talk about Adam and Eve, and then we're told in the teachings of the new church that Adam and Eve weren't real people. Well, they represented groups of people. We do that all the time, don't we? Actually, in the way we talk about different groups, different countries have a certain name perhaps we use. Uh, people talk about the United States as Uncle Sam. There's no Uncle Sam. It just is a, an image. It's an icon. And more and more in modern society, we use icons and they represent things and, and we see right away what they mean. Well, the icons, as it were, the representatives and the significatives of the Old Testament, especially these first 11 chapters of Genesis, they're all representative, iconic, as it were. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the story of the generations that came after Adam and Eve. And these generations that deteriorate until we find the story of Noah, verses 4 and 5, after Cain slews Abel. These generations all represent a decrease of the spirituality, the celestial, the heavenly love that people felt towards the Lord. A decrease. Until finally it reached the state of Noah. And Noah stands for those same people, those groups of people who followed the Lord this way, having very, very little perception now of what comes from God and what is their own. And it said Noah set, was set apart to stand for a new ability that we have in spiritual life. To not get stuck by the poison, the persuasion, the evil of the giants of the land spoken of in the story. Those giants of the land were told, stand for a childlike attachment to the things that we just want. The people of that most ancient time, Adam and Eve and those generations, were said to be celestial people, the most ancient church, but their will and their understanding were together. What they thought, they felt. What they felt, they thought. They didn't separate them the way we can. So we're told they're of a special kind of genius, a special kind of mentality that no longer exists today the same way. One way of thinking about it is the beautiful innocence of children, but when a toddler has something in their hand and you take it away, they might not be able to see the reason for it. And sitting there reasoning with them really probably won't do any good at all. They're stuck. They're stuck in what they want when they want it and everything revolves around that. We're supposed to mature out of that, aren't we? I hope we all have to a certain extent. And yet we still find ourselves pretty stuck with the things we really want. We can become very obsessed and thinking about the same things over and over again. We can become very compulsive in doing the same thing that gave us delight before, but now may not be healthy. It's a kind of sticky evil and falsity that drags us down. It's what sunk the people at the time of the flood. And so the ark stands for the ability the Lord has to raise our understanding, the way we can see things, above what we want. You might try to see if that works for you right now. Right now, you're sitting in church. You've come to church for whatever reason it is. But there might be something else that you want to do more right now. I don't want you all to get up and leave and go do it. But I want you to think about if there is something pressing out there that you're actually able to stay in your seats, finish the sermon, socialize, and then get off and do what you want to do. Imagine if you couldn't help yourself. And you heard there's a sale that's ending at 11 o'clock. You're not going to make it if you stay in church. And you really want that, whatever it is. What is it for you? We each have things that we, we want. Everybody's got something they want. It might not be a car or a new pair of shoes. It might be a fine meal or a vacation. And there's going to be a sale and it's going to end at 11 o'clock and you're not going to make it if you stay in church. Imagine your inability to sit and stay because you have to have that thing. 
we're told that the people of the most ancient church, the people who drowned in the flood, were unable to separate a desire from their ability to think it through and stay in their seats. It talks about it as being like a glue, a spiritual glue that made them stick in their thoughts to whatever they wanted in their heart. And that the Lord actually provides us with a new way of thinking that wasn't available to them then. It's actually called a new regeneration. Which is um, kind of a repetitive. Regeneration means rebirth. A new rebirthing. A new way for people to become in the life of heaven. Because the people of that church, represented by Adam and Eve, they went to heaven. They're told to be one of the highest heavens. Celestial heaven. We're able also, in the teachings now given to us through the new church, to achieve that kind of love. But it comes with struggle, and it comes with temptation. That's what's represented by the flood. That's what's represented by the ark being tossed back and forth. If we think about it as a real story, we imagine 40 days and 40 nights. Oh my goodness, with all those animals. It probably smelled pretty bad. One window, one door, not a whole lot of ventilation. Tossed around, day and night, rain descending, so much rain that every part of the land was covered over. So we're told in the teachings of the new church that we have to lift ourselves above the way the literal story is written. The literal sense of the word. Let's move our minds a bit to the story of the last judgment that Jesus talks about with his disciples. When's this going to happen, they say? Because that flood represents a passing of one state and the beginning of a new state. And that new state continued on till Jesus came. And then there was another flood. Then there was another set of judgments taking place to allow a new Christian church to come out of that. And Jesus was talking about not just that time when he was on earth and his glorification and resurrection, but also the time when there would be a general judgment upon the teachings that had been abused in the Christian church. What we call the last judgment and then the establishment or giving of the teachings of the new church. The word that is called the evangel of the new advent. Jesus said, the time will be like it was when Noah. When the people around his time were eating and drinking and being married and getting married and being given in marriage. Everybody was having a great time on the external. And they didn't know except when the flood came and they perished. So shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. You shall see him in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That Expression is repeated a number of times. And if we go back to the story of Noah, where do you find reference to clouds in the coming of the Lord? I wore my celebratory stole because it kind of illustrates at the very bottom a lot of water and passing through states and the clouds of the where it, wherein the rainbow was seen, but that's a sermon for a week or two from now. But clouds are playing a great part because clouds represent the way we think, we see the Lord, we feel the brightness, we have a sense that the Lord's present there, but we, don't, we, we can never stare directly or see the Lord directly. We always see the Lord through the clouds of heaven, especially when we're on earth. We always see the Lord through these stories of the Word. They're the clouds. Jesus said, I will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Another place in the word it talks about, the Lord's glory is never given except in a cloud. And in one of the hymns that we just sang, it talks about the pillar of fire and the cloud that guides us. The Lord leads us by means of appearances. The appearances of Noah are appearances of a story that looks really literal, but it sounds unbelievable because it didn't literally happen. The story of Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven looks very literal. And so people expect that if Jesus is going to make his second coming, 
the clouds in the sky are going to be really bright, and there he will be. Because they're not applying the same teaching to the literal sense of the word. That's an image. That's an appearance. That's an accommodation so that we can understand the Lord coming to us. So we're talking about historical references to Noah way back whenever that was, to Jesus 2,000 or so years ago, to Jesus' prophecy concerning the Last Judgment that we know from the teachings of the new church took place around 1757, around the time that the Lord was giving the teachings of his new church to reveal the internal sense of his word, to allow us to see him again anew, to allow him to finish the glorification process that began while he was on earth. He finished it by means of providing a new set of teachings that explain the way his rational mind worked, the, the way he underwent temptations and struggles throughout his life, the way the floods came upon him, and he addressed every section of hell and put all of those in hell in their place. And the giants of the land, the Nephilim, were one of the first to attack the Lord while he was on earth. And that then is fully explained in the teachings of the Arcana Celestia, the book from which the first lesson was taken. These clouds, or these appearances of the Lord to our minds, come in natural words, natural statements, statements that are of deep theology and philosophy. But still, it's in clouds that the Lord appears to us. I want to take your minds to another story in the Word, which is the Lord's transfiguration. You know that story. After six days, it says, the Lord took Peter, James, and John. Peter standing for the things of the understanding. James standing for good or the desire to do what is right. Peter, James, and John standing for the charity or love behind. So it's a little uh, trinity, not of those three people, but of the ideas of what really allows us to see the Lord in his word transfigured. What really lets us get close to the Lord and have the Lord in our hearts? It's an understanding of him represented by Peter. It's the doing of the good things that the word tells us to do. James. And it's also the love or the charity. John. The Lord appears to us when those three things are operating. So it says after six days, not 40 days, but a similar kind of a, uh, correspondence. After a period of struggle and preparation, the Lord allows us, the Lord allows us to be saved. He always wants us saved. But we have to do the work that will allow him to save us. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured. Moses and Elijah were seen on either side of him. And then a voice came out of a cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. Later on in the Noah story, as I said, it's going to be talked about in a sermon or two, a cloud will appear and a rainbow will appear in that cloud standing for the Lord's love for us, a spectrum of affections and ideas that the Lord gives us to delight us in the teachings of heaven and to remind us that he is always in and above the clouds when we're in temptation and struggle. But today's lesson has to do with the temptation and struggle of a flood and coming to understand what the Lord frees us from when he builds or allows us to build an ark by means of his word. I say allow us, but it's, it's not like the Lord wants to hold us back. We're allowed by taking the things of the word to build that which is necessary to lift us up. It looks as if we're building it. All the instructions given to Noah look as if Noah's building it. Yes, in the story. But the Lord is the only one who can save you. The Lord is the only one who can actually see that which is gracious and merciful within himself that can attach to what's 
gracious and merciful within us. Noah, is said, found grace in the eyes of God. The Lord allows you to take the teachings of his word. As well as we can see those teachings, as it were, in a cloud. And allows you to apply those teachings and to then return love to him. Peter, James, and John represent the ability that the Lord gives us to rise up. They took, went up upon a mountain and actually see the Lord. The Lord with Moses standing for the Old Testament teachings of the law and Elias representing the prophets that carried on all through the teachings of the Old Testament and then into the New Testament. Those characters are in you. The way the Lord appears to you is by means of those things that are already His gifts from you, from Him to you. Reading the story of Noah might seem like an ancient history about something a long time ago, especially if we get stuck in the literal sense of the story and don't want to allow ourselves to listen to what the Word says in telling us, don't get stuck in the literal sense of the story. Allow yourself to see the teachings of the Word given in the New Testament and given, given in the Evangel or the writings of the New Church to know that the literal vision of the Lord in Genesis 1 through 11, those literal visions are meant to be elevated and be seen to be what they really are. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus went through all the prophets all the law and the prophets to explain to the disciples walking with him how he indeed was the Christ. Remember that story related to the Easter story. People said they'd seen the Lord here, they'd seen the Lord there. And then it said, yes, two disciples were walking from Emmaus. They came running back to tell us they'd seen Jesus and how he had opened their eyes to see how he was the promised Messiah and that their eyes were really open to see who he was when he broke bread with them, and then he vanished from their sight. The Lord gives us just enough glimpses to continue to follow him without overpowering us with the glory of his presence. Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and it said he was given instructions to build this ark. Noah and that grace, and the word it talks about grace and mercy, that the Lord, with the celestial people, with those who really love the Lord, feel nothing, nothing but mercy. But people who are of a spiritual understanding, those of us who are raising up our understanding, thinking a lot about things, we have a hard time with just mercy. Grace is, is hard enough too. What is mercy and grace when it comes to the Lord? You think, well, it's the Lord always loving the sinner, always loving us when we're in states of evil. It does say that's what it is, but it also says, and all the people of heaven in heaven know that they have nothing but mercy and grace that have lifted them out of their own natural state into the state which is heavenly. No matter what level of heaven they are in, no matter what good state we're in, we're only in that state because of mercy and grace. The Lord's presence ever desiring to save us, to lift us up above the flood of our own evils. Obsession and compulsion are two signs of the kind of stickiness of evil that keeps us from following the Lord and rising up above what the Lord, rising up above ourselves to what the Lord gives us. The obsession and the compulsion of the people of the most ancient church, the giants of that time, we're told that the Lord has conquered that hell and it doesn't take over our minds the way it did throughout those times and even into the time when Jesus came on earth. But we still have an ability to get stuck in things that obsess our minds and in behaviors that we remain compuls compulsive with. We're told, told over and over again in the writings of the new church that evil itself is contagious and addictive and that we can get easily stuck in the addiction or the bonding that takes place between our thoughts and our behaviors and whatever it is, what process, whatever substance, whatever relationship, we can get stuck in that. 
That's what kept people not from floating. That's what the Lord separated in us was the ability to be stuck in whatever we thought and whatever we felt. So we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord with Noah in thanking the Lord. Again, it's going to be in a few more sermons to see Noah getting out of the ark and uh, seeing the rainbow and the promise made at that point. We thank the Lord, though, that he has given us the ability to lift our minds up above just whatever we want, just whatever we think, in order to understand who he is. The three disciples saw the Lord transfigured. They knew after the voice from the cloud spoke to them that this was the one true God of heaven and earth. The opening sentence said after the word uh, was opened was that the, in the new church we will worship a visible God in whom is the invisible. It's the crown of all churches because we have this ability to see the Lord in his word through the word of the Old Testament, the New Testament, the writings of the new church. Always with clouds, always with appearances that are appropriate to the way we think. But the Lord can be transfigured before us if we take the things of our faith the th things of our behavior and the things of our love to him. He will show himself to us and we can indeed worship him as the one God of heaven and earth.